Hello and welcome to everyone online. Thanks for joining today. If we're pleased to bring you this policy seminar on introducing ProWEA complementary indicators for nutrition sensitive agriculture and market inclusion projects. I'm Dan Gilligan. I'm the Deputy Director of IFPRI's Poverty Health and Nutrition Division. Thanks for joining today. So today you'll hear from IFPRI senior leadership, senior researchers, the WEA research team, and other research partners and key stakeholders about these latest adaptations of the project level Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index. This policy seminar will introduce the new health and nutrition and market inclusion indicators and explain how they can guide nutrition sensitive and market inclusion elements of agricultural development projects. Then a panel of stakeholders, project implementers, researchers, and donors will offer comments on these new tools and their relevance. We'd like to hear from you. To participate in our Q&A session, please submit your questions at ifree.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using hashtag pound ask ifpre on Twitter. And with that, let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce Pranima Menon. Her name is Senior Director of Food and Nutrition Policy in the CGIAR, and she's Senior Research Fellow at IFPRI. Pranima, thanks for joining to offer some welcome remarks, and over to you. Thank you, Dan, and, and thank you to the whole team. I'm really thrilled to be able to join you all here today. Uh, so Senior Director uh, for Food and Nutrition Policy, which is a new role at, at, at IFPRI and in the CGIAR, I supervise a large portfolio of research that covers a range of issues related to nutrition, diets, and health, markets, institute, and trade, um, and the role of social policy and inclusion, inclusion in particular. I'm particularly reminded in our work that people and families are really at the heart of what we do, however. And in the final analysis, you know, our work must really be for the well-being of individuals, especially those who are really vulnerable around the world. This includes women and men, boys and girls, in their families, in their communities, and really in larger populations around the world. Over the years um, of, of research in economics and agriculture and nutrition and, and, and more, we recognize that women's roles in these aspects is, is very, very important, especially their productive and reproductive roles, and that really understanding and, and uh, developing strategies for increasing women's abilities to take strategic decisions and to act on those decisions is is really important. Now, the work on the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, which has really been an effort to capture the dynamics and the balance of power in inter-household decision-making on critical issues around agriculture, is now very well known around the world. Researchers at IFPRI and the CGIR in, partnerships with, in partnership with people uh, and organizations around the world have developed these uh, indicators over the last decade. Now, as the value of the W, uh, the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index really shown, uh, it became clear that there are some other areas of food systems where the world would benefit from the, the kind of thinking and the rigorous research that went into the original way, both on what happens in health and nutrition in households and also what happens around markets and food systems. And so today's uh, event is actually focused exactly on those two areas. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to this policy seminar where the team will launch two sets of indicators to complement the project level WEA, what's called the pro WEA. These are complementary indicators. They relate primarily to women's agency and decision-making in health and nutrition and to women's and men's inclusion and participation in markets and food systems related decisions. These are in a sense like two sides of the same coin, right? Enabling us to look both, uh, look at multiple facets of women's roles, both in the productive and what happens in some parts of the domestic space. Now, just as other uh, bodies of research that have been done in the context of the WEA, the, this body of work and the pro WEA family of metrics were also developed through a participatory design process with IFPRI uh, researchers and partners and have been tested in six projects in three countries for the health and nutrition module in Bangladesh, Burkina Faso and Mali, and four projects in four countries for the market inclusion model module, sorry, uh, in Bangladesh, Benin, uh, Malawi, and the Philippines. So we really hope that the work that's been done on these complementary indicators will help to inform project designers, implementers, and researchers as they work to understand what's happening in these areas um, in terms of how these dynamics play out, um, and, and to use that understanding to then improve food and nutrition security and really advance gender equality and women's empowerment in low and middle income countries. In closing, in my opening remarks, I just want to say that the, the way of work is a body of work that we're incredibly proud of at IFPRI 
and across the CGIR. Um, and, I'm, and we're just really thrilled to see these multiple adaptations of it that you know, really bring those constructs uh, to areas that are so important to continue to open the box around. Uh, so with that, let me close my opening remarks and hand it back to the team and, and really wish you all a very enjoyable and productive uh, seminar. I'm really looking forward to hearing how the discussion itself unfolds. Uh, back to you, Dan. Great, thanks, Pranima. Appreciate it. Uh, now I'm really pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, Shakuntala Thilsted is director of the CJIAR Nutrition, Health, and Food Security Impact Area Platform. And we'll now share uh, some video remarks from Shakuntala. Thanks. Greetings, everyone. My name is Shakuntala, and I am the director of the Nutrition, Health, and Food Security Impact Area Platform of the CGIR. This platform has just been initiated. It is one of five impact area platforms of the CGIR. My work will focus on demonstrating the impact of the research, approaches, and innovations of the CGIR and its partners on nutrition, health, and food security. In order to show impact, we must, of course, be able to measure impact. Within the areas of food, nutrition, and health, there are well-documented and validated indicators which have been used for quite some time. These include, for example, indicators on diet quality. These also include measurements on people, for example, anthropometric indicators. Now there is a growing interest on the role of women's empowerment and agency and the impact that these have on diets, nutrition, on health. It is therefore important that we can measure women's empowerment and agency. It is a pleasure for me to inform that researchers of the Gender, Agriculture and Assets Project led by IFPRI has developed the ProRIA for Health and Nutrition. The ProRIA for Health and Nutrition is a dashboard of indicators to measure women's agency with respect to nutrition and health. Much work has been gone into the development and the trial of these indicators. The ProRIA for Health and Nutrition allows us to focus on women as key decision makers, as individuals, and also as household and community members for improving nutrition and health of the woman herself, as well as for her family members and members of her community. Thus, the pro rear for health and nutrition should be used in the CGIRA initiatives and projects I look forward to working with others so that we can make full use of this in the impact area which I lead. Please do read more about the ProVIA for Health and Nutrition. Contact the members of the research team and let us all make an effort to use this dashboard of indicators in order that we can show the impact of women's agency on nutrition and health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Inga Brower. Inga is at Wageningen University in Research in IFPRI, where she's lead of the CGIR Initiative on Sustainable Healthy Diets Through Food Systems Transformation, or SHIP. Welcome, Inga, over to you. Thank you, Dan, and um, thank you also for the invitation. I'm really happy to add my voice to those of Pernima and uh, Shakuntala uh, to introduce this uh, seminar, really important seminar. And in our initiative, Sustainable Healthy Diets, and you see the um, um, acronym above, we, we aim, and the title is already saying that, we aim to ensure sustainable healthy diets for all through food system transformation, and we do so by uniquely focusing on the consumer side um, of the food system and aim to stimulate the demand for sustainable healthy diets. But 
we do realize, of course, that if the demand is increased, these sustainable nutritious foods, and then I'm talking about foods that are more nutritious and safe and affordable and sustainably produced, they should be available to the consumers. And we do recognize the importance of the micro, small and medium enterprises or MSMEs, and especially the informal sector actors to deliver these foods to the consumer. And at the same time, have to be able to have a decent income. And these informal markets are an important source of employment in low and middle income countries, and especially so for women and marginalized social groups. But many jobs we know in the informal sector offer low and certain income and poor labor conditions. And the focus on empowerment of women as key actors in the food system is critical to enhancing the potential impacts on their own and their household diets and on their own and their household nutrition and health. But if we look at the um, attention that is given uh, to women, it has mostly been given to women's roles as consumers and caregivers um, compared to the attention given to their role in commercial aspects of the food systems. Uh, but we know that women in low and middle income countries tend to be overrepresented in jobs in this food sector compared to other sectors. And for example, um, um, in Africa, if we're in West Africa, about 80%. And, and about 70% of those employed in food processing and in food marketing, they are women. So, but we know had that limited access to credit, um, uh, uh, things like training or transportation um, or restrictive gender norms or time burdens, they really limit uh, women's ability to participate with real agency. Um, to engage in more lucrative or large-scale activities in the food system, um, and they also and to receive a fair compensation. And in addressing these challenges, um, the initiative SHIFT embarks on so-called gender-responsive food system research. So giving greater attention to gender issues and ensuring that it does not exacerbate existing inequalities and where feasible, of course, foster a positive change in women's empowerment. But there is actually little understanding and knowledge of this micro, small and medium enterprises in low and middle income countries. And if you look at what is available, it generally excludes information on the informal uh, sector. And it's also not really gender disaggregated. And to a large extent, it is so because we do not have data and especially indicators to support such understanding and to support the understanding of the role and the effect of projects um, on this role um, of women um, in the market. And therefore, I'm also very happy that um, this pro VEA and then especially on the market inclusion is now being launched. And I'm really looking forward um, to see uh, or to hear also more details of this pro VEA. And I'm sure that it will help uh, to proceed with our projects in our initiative. And it's really my hope that it will build on a better understanding of the role of women um, in, uh, in markets and in, especially in informal markets. So thank you a lot and a lot of success and uh, the word back to you, Dan. Thank you, Inga, appreciate it. So we will be coming to the Q&A portion of our event soon. So please continue to submit your questions again on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using hashtag uh, askifpre on Twitter. So next I'd like to introduce Hazel Malapi and Jessica Heckert to introduce the new modules. Hazel is senior research coordinator at IFPRI and Jessica is a research fellow at IFPRI. Hazel, I'll pass to you. Thank you, Dan, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, Jessica and I are here representing a huge team of partners and collaborators, um, too many to mention in our short time today, but I just wanna acknowledge their essential contributions to this work. Um, can we have the presentation up, please? So while we're waiting, um, yes, next slide. So before we, get into the complementary indicators, I wanted to give a bit of context on where this all came from. And so some of you um, in the audience may 
already be familiar with the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, or WEA for short, which was developed by USAID, IFPRI, and the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative back in 2012 to measure women's inclusion in the agricultural sector. Um, at the time, it was, it was a really unique uh, measure because it uses data from both men and women in the same household in population-based surveys. And so this is a feature that allows us to look at empowerment gaps within the household. Um, the way it draws heavily from Nyla Kabir's definition of empowerment, which is expanding people's ability to make strategic life choices, particularly in contexts in which this ability had been denied to them. And in Kabir's definition, the ability to exercise choice encompasses three dimensions, so resources, agency, and achievements or well-being outcomes. So the way uh, focuses on the agency aspect of this empowerment process. Now, over the last decade, um, we've been continually refining the WEA to meet the needs of its users. So under the second phase of the Gender, Agriculture and Assets Project, or GAP2, we worked with 13 projects in nine countries to co-develop the project level WEA or the pro WEA to meet the demands of projects for a measure of empowerment that would highlight aspects of empowerment that were deemed important in the project context and assess impacts of the project's interventions on empowerment. Next slide, please. So in addition to the demand for a way as suited for project use, we also found that specialized projects such as nutrition sensitive agricultural projects and market inclusion or value chain projects may require additional indicators to capture aspects of women's agency and empowerment. And this is really why we developed these optional add on modules for projects that are focused on health and nutrition and market inclusion. Next slide, please. So our starting point for any project that would like to measure impacts on empowerment outcomes is the PROWEA. So PROWEA consists of 10 equally weighted indicators that measure three types of agency. We have intrinsic agency, power within, instrumental agency, power to, and collective agency, power with. And this covers a broad range of livelihoods. Um, we don't have time to go over each indicator today, but for those of you who are interested, the quantitative methodology is detailed in our World Development 2019 paper, and we also have a discussion paper on the lessons from our qualitative research. Um, as I mentioned, the PROWEA is intended for projects that have concrete strategies that are expected to lead to women's empowerment. However, Projects that aim to reach and benefit women can also use PROWEA to ensure that interventions do not contribute to disempowerment. So even if empowerment is not the primary focus of the project, you can still use PROWEA to monitor unintended consequences. Next slide, please. In addition to the PROWEA, we developed ad optional add-on modules for projects that are focused on health and nutrition and market inclusion, as you can see here. So these complementary indicators are not included in calculating the composite PROWEA score. So instead, these are designed and interpreted uh, to be presented and interpreted alongside the PROWEA uh, to provide additional information. So let me now hand off to Jessica for the health and nutrition indicators. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, so in this section, um, I'm going to discuss our work developing the PROWEA Health and Nutrition Module. If you could go to the next slide. Um, the PROWEA Health and Nutrition Module and its associated indicators are, are designed to measure women's health and nutrition related agency. And again, as Hazel mentioned, this was a, a really large collaboration among a number of people at IFPRI, as well as in the broader um, gender assets and agriculture portfolio. So in our next slide, some of you may wonder why we need additional survey content that focuses specifically on women's health and nutrition related agency. Many agricultural development projects that aim to empower women also have nutrition sensitive objectives. These projects may aim to increase the consumption of foods produced by the household or increase women's income and encourage them to, to purchase specific food and uh, health inputs. To understand the ways in which nutrition sensitive agriculture projects empower women, we need to capture the multidimensionality of women's empowerment. So for example, a woman who has control over decisions related to raising, raising livestock 
might not have control over whether she can consume its milk or meat um, or, or when she can seek health care. The health and nutrition module was developed to measure these aspects of agency. Next slide, please. Many of the GAP2 projects were nutrition sensitive agriculture interventions. These interventions had the goal of improving women's empowerment, as well as improving the nutritional status of women beneficiaries and or their children. Six of these projects piloted the health and nutrition module and collectively we determined that the module we were developing needed to consider UNICEF's food health and care paradigm, which many programs use to inform their theory of change, the module also needed to be life cycle sensitive and consider the necessary inputs as well as how women's agency differs um, according to the life cycle. And then the module also needed to consider animal sourced foods, which are often important in nutrition sensitive agriculture. Methodologically, the module was developed using cognitive interviewing, which is a method that can help us identify and correct errors in how survey questions are asked. We also use psychometric methods, including um, exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis to identify seven underlying domains, which became the indicators. And finally, we use the Alcuri Foster methods, which are common across our way of metrics to identify adequacy cutoffs for each indicator. So in our next slide, um, you'll see these seven indicators, which are decides on own health and diet, decides on own health and diet during pregnancy, decides on child's diet, decides on weaning and breastfeeding, decides to purchase food and health products, can access food and health products, and decides to seek health care. So in our next slide, this shows the pooled means for each of these indicators uh, for the three projects in Bangladesh and the three projects in Burkina Faso and Mali. It's important to note that these values are from data collected for project evaluations and they are not nationally representative. So we can't use this to compare the two regions, but what we can do is use these data to monitor change within these individual project samples. And so importantly from these data, we can determine the areas in which women have limited agency, so for example, some of the lowest levels of agency in Burkina Faso and Mali are in terms of deciding to purchase food and health products. And we can also see that the indicators all have room for improvement um, over time throughout project life cycles. So in the next slide, I'd like to conclude with some specific recommendations for using the ProWEA health and nutrition module. First, the module should be used together with core ProWEA because they're intended to assess different yet complementary domains of women's empowerment. Additionally, we don't recommend aggregating the indicators as some of these indicators only apply to specific life cycle phases. And that also means that ideally the user can select only the types of indicators that are needed for that specific project. Overall, using the ProWEA Health and Nutrition module can help, help us understand how nutrition sensitive agriculture in particular can help foster women's empowerment and the extent to which empowerment in these domains can lead to improved outcomes. With that in mind, um, we describe in the associated paper, which you can find in uh, uh, recently published in uh, Maternal Child Nutrition, um, how it's compatible with a wide range of different evaluation designs. Um, and then we also recommend that in many cases that it's useful to uh, pair this module with other nutrition and diet related outcomes. Uh, thank you and back to Hazel. Thanks, Jessica. Um, next slide, please. Okay, now, so over to the ProWaya for market inclusion, um, add on indicators. Um, next slide, please. So one of the questions that's always at the back of our minds as developers of these tools is, are the original domains over which we're measuring empowerment still relevant? 
And this is really coming out of the recognition that the world is changing, especially for women and girls. I think Inga touched on the, these trends in her remarks. Um, uh, globally, we're observing increased market orientation, greater importance of rural non-farm enterprises, an increase in non-agricultural employment, and increased migration and urbanization. And so in response to these trends, many development organizations are designing and implementing value chain or market inclusion interventions with the goal of reaching women, benefiting women, and supporting the empowerment of women throughout the food system. But is market inclusion really conducive to women's empowerment? And the answer is we won't know unless we measure it. So monitoring and evaluating the success of these interventions requires tools to identify the constraints women and men face and to track empowerment across multiple nodes of the value chain and throughout food systems. So what we've done here is to adapt the PROWEA for market inclusion projects by expanding the coverage of the tool beyond production and processing and considering respondents' roles in higher nodes of agricultural value chains and in formal and in formal and informal wage employment. Um, so here we used um, an iterative mixed methods approach. So really building on the latest versions of the PROWEA qualitative and quantitative tools and then adapting them to the context and specific project goals in four country case studies. So we have the Philippines, Bangladesh, Benin and Malawi. In the Philippines study, the goal was of the project was to assess empowerment potential of uh, the target value chains, uh, baka, coconut, seaweed, and swine. In the Bangladesh study, the goal of the project was to assess empowerment among different value chain actors, so agricultural producers, entrepreneurs, and wage workers. And then in the Benin and Malawi studies, these were part of the agricultural technical vocational education and training program for women at Vet for Women. And the goal of the project was to assess the empowerment impact of the training intervention. So in Benin, the study focused on rice, soy, compost, and poultry value chains. And then in Malawi, the focus was on vegetables. So the PROWEA for market inclusion tool evolved over the course of these full four studies, reflecting lessons learned from implementation in each iteration. And so these lessons contributed to improved versions of the questionnaire over time, um, improved interview guides, and then ultimately we come to the recommended set of additional indicators that were validated using cognitive interviewing and qualitative work. Next slide, please. So here we have the six indicators of agency to support market inclusion. And um, the colors on the left of the indicator um, shows the type of agency it measures. So matching the same colors on the ProWaya wheel. So the first two indicators measure intrinsic agency, and then the, the third and fourth indicators measure instrumental agency. And then the last two indicators are not direct measures of agency, rather they are capturing factors in the environment which can either support or hinder a woman's ability to exercise agency. So it's really a different domain altogether that's not in ProWaya, and so that's why you don't see any color coding there. Um, and so these first four indicators are actually quite similar with existing ProWaya indicators. And the main difference is that the market inclusion indicators focus on aspects relevant to higher nodes of the value chains, whereas the ProWaya indicators are intended to capture agency more generally. So entrepreneurial mindset is really very similar to the self-efficacy indicator in ProWaya. The main difference is that it, the statements that, that are used here are more relevant to entrepreneurship. And then autonomy in working conditions is very similar to the autonomy and in income indicator in ProWaya, but here we're asking about working um, uh, conditions rather than income broadly. So um, I, I did want to touch on the last two indicators. These are the ones that are maybe most unfamiliar. Um, access to reliable sanitation while working. So this captures whether the respondent has access to clean and safe space to urinate, defecate, and wash their hands at their place of work. And then finally, feel safe from sexual harassment while working. This indicator should be calculated for women only. So it aims to capture the extent to which women perceive sexual harassment in the work environment as a barrier to her own ability to work. Um, next slide, please. 
And so in terms of our recommendations for implementation, um, I did want to emphasize the sampling strategy. So um, as Jessica, as we mentioned earlier, and as Jessica also emphasized, these tools are designed for implementation in the project context. And so we recommend obtaining data from the intended beneficiaries of the specific market inclusion and value chain interventions. Um, and even for diagnostic studies, um, you where you don't require a comparison group, you still need to ensure that actors in higher nodes of the value chain, such as processors, traders, aggregators are well represented. Um, we, in all the case studies, these are purposive, we used purposive sampling strategies. So uh, as we mentioned, you should not take this to be statistically representative of the country or the region. Um, Second, the market inclusion indicators can't stand alone. So I just want to emphasize again, you need to use this alongside ProAya indicators, and this is not to replace them. Uh, and then finally, um, you all the different because value chains are, are so diverse, um, we encourage users to really think through which indicators are really most relevant to their project context. And so um, all of these indicators are optional and we encourage users to uh, really uh, have, you know, under, try to understand the experiences of women and men in the target value chains and use that uh, understanding of the context to select which indicators to prioritize. Sometimes that might mean um, um, doing a bit more formative research. Um, and then finally, just to reiterate the importance of qualitative work. So all of our tools include both quantitative and qualitative tools. So thank you so much. Um, I just want to uh, take a moment to acknowledge our funders. If you go to the last slide, please quickly. Oh, okay, no more time. But I do, do want to acknowledge the broad team that contributed to this effort. And please uh, visit wea.ifpre.info for all the latest updates. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Hazel and Jessica. That was uh, really great, a really excellent overview of the new modules. Thanks. Uh, everyone, please continue to submit your questions. You can do so at ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using hashtag askifpre on Twitter. So now we will move to the panel discussion about these tools. Our first panelist is Elizabeth Kirkwood. Uh, she's a research fellow at the Sydney School of Public Health at the University of Sydney. Elizabeth was one of the earliest users of ProWaya Health and Nutrition Module, which she used in her dissertation. So let's listen to Elizabeth's video remarks about how having this tool helped in conducting her research and what insights she learned. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Kirkwood and I am a research fellow and lecturer at the Sydney School of Public Health at the University of Sydney. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to share my insights with using the ProWaya tool today. My research aims to improve the health status of women and children with a focus on understanding the intersection of gender and public health interventions. And my work is mainly in South and Southeast Asia. Share a little bit of background on the project that we've been using the ProWaya with the addition of the health and nutrition module on. And that is the Shonjibon cash and counseling trial. It's a two-arm cluster randomised control trial that aims to reduce childhood stunting. And we've enrolled 2,840 women in the trial. This trial examines the impact of nutrition behaviour change communications and cash transfers on child undernutrition, so with the aim of reducing stunting. So women were enrolled in the study when pregnancy was confirmed and they received nutrition counselling from a call centre, as well as nutrition behaviour change communication that was delivered on a mobile app, as well as an unconditional cash transfer that was delivered via the Bcash mobile banking app. So they enrolled in the study when pregnancy was confirmed and they stay in the study until the child is 18 months of age. The location of our study is, as you can see there, in Sirajganj, in two districts in northern Bangladesh. And the majority of households were employed in agricultural work. And although the SCC trial is not an agricultural invention, intervention, we really felt that the ProAir tool was appropriate in this context. 
uh, women in Bangladesh characteristically do post-harvest activities and processing, and they might not necessarily classify themselves as agricultural workers. So it's in this context that we were using uh, the pro -air to survey women whose livelihoods were really bound to the agricultural sector. And I think as Al Kiri describes the pro -air, it's an information platform that is applicable in broader contexts other than exclusively agricultural interventions. I think we all know that there's evidence that links uh, women's empowerment and nutrition outcomes, but we really need more robust evidence to clarify those pathways of impact. And that's where the pro comes in to, you know, to help us provide that evidence. So the focus of my research and my PhD was to assess the impact of the SCC trial on women's empowerment. And we did spend a lot of time thinking about how we could do that and measure the impact of the trial. So we, are, we have used the pro with all 12 indicators as well as the health and nutrition module. And then we have constructed a composite indicator using six of the indicators, which you can see there, control over the use of income, input into production decisions, autonomy and income, decision-making power about women and children's health and nutrition, respect among household members and attitudes toward intimate partner violence. Indicator with those six indicators, as mentioned previously, are the ones that are most likely to be directly impacted from our trial. But we're also going to have secondary study outcomes which will really delve more deeply into that control over income and economic resources, that input into decision-making power in nutrition and healthcare, and the experience and attitude toward intimate partner violence. Proware included questions around the attitude toward domestic violence or intimate partner violence. But for our study, we added additional questions from the World Health Organization's violence against women and girls questionnaire. And the reason we did this was that evidence suggests that when that you combine cash transfers and behavior change communication that can increase women's bargaining power and poverty related emotional well-being and this can lead to a reduction in intimate partner violence. And this was based on research done by the Transfer Modality Research Institute amongst others. Where are we now with the trial? Well, I'd love to be presenting the baseline data at the moment, but we're still analysing that and the project, the end line data will start to collect later in the year. So I think the key insights I'd like to share is that you really can tailor the tool to suit the needs of your project in the specific context uh, that you have. You can also develop, we developed context specific qualitative guidelines to complement the quantitative data that we collected. It really takes time to administer the questionnaire. So we allowed separate interview time um, for that to take place. We had to do additional training with our staff to undertake the interviews, which was separate training sessions. So it, it takes time and there can be pushback, but it's such an important um, area to, to, to document. Uh, we interviewed women only quantitatively, but we qualitatively interviewed women, men, family members, and mother-in-laws as well. So I think the pro has really helped us to understand the complex and multidimensional nature of women's empowerment and been a really valuable tool for our project. Acknowledge my research team, my fellow researchers, and our implementing partner in Bangladesh at ICDDRB, and also to everyone at IFPRI for generously sharing the knowledge and tools. I've just added the links to the protocol papers linked to the main trial and the women's empowerment um, protocol paper as well. And the additional paper down the end is uh, another trial that we have in Bangladesh, and we're going to use components of the pro there to assess changes in gender relations in a clean uh, cook stove intervention. So any questions or comments, feel free to email me. And um, thank you very much for your time. Great, very helpful to have that perspective on the use of the modules. 
So next we'll hear from Rama Adam, a uh, social inclusion and market scientist and the East and Southern Africa Regional Focal Point for the One CGIR Research and Development Initiatives at, at World Fish. So Rahma, you're leading a research project in Bangladesh that is using an adapted version of the ProWea tool in small-scale fisheries and aquaculture, the ProWefi, and a project in Kenya that's using an adapted version of the abbreviated WEA, the AWEA tool, in small-scale fisheries and aquaculture there. And then you're also using the ProWea health and nutrition module to measure changes in women's empowerment. So my question for you is, can you tell us more about your experience in using these tools and what are some of the key lessons that are emerging from your findings so far? Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to ladies and gentlemen. So for us at World Fish, um, we wanted to measure the impact of fisheries and, aquacul on, and aquaculture projects on women's empowerment and nutrition. It's very important to have a good reliable diagnostic tool to do so. And uh, in order to do that, we worked with our partners to develop um, a project level women's empowerment in fisheries and aquaculture index. We call it ProWefi, which is based on the ProAI. But this version is specifically designed to capture the empowerment, the agency, and inclusion of women in contexts where livelihoods are largely based on fisheries and aquaculture. So uh, we did a cognitive study in India. Um, and then we validated the uh, ProWefi tool along with the health and nutrition module that was developed through the ProWefi by IFPRI through the IDEA project in Bangladesh. So I think it's important I tell you a bit about the IDEA project. The IDEA project was implemented in order to enhance incomes, diets, um, uh, nutrition for smallholder families and to increase opportunities for women's empowerment through aquaculture in Bangladesh. And the project applied a nutrition sensitive perspective, given that fish is very rich, highly micronutrient rich food, to ensure that women's empowerment in fish production leads to improved in nutrition, especially for women and children. So the ProWefi was used to measure to, to the, the extent to which the idea project intervention contributes to reaching versus benefiting, particularly the nutritional benefit, versus empowering women, versus uh, changing or attributing to changing to restrictive gender social norms in Bangladesh. And the health and nutrition add-on module was included to explore the empowerment nutrition pathway that comes out of the reintervention. And we also applied the intersectional lens, explore differential effects among women from various socioeconomic groups um, and age groups. And so we conducted the measurement by grouping the beneficiaries into three groups. The first group, this is the treatment arm where the women and men receive agri agricultural training, gender training and nutrition. The second group, which is an interesting group, this is the group of landless women. These are women who are poor. Uh, they do not own land in Northwestern Bangladesh. So uh, World Fish worked with the government, the local government in Rajshahi to provide for us a pond. Uh, where we, we, we were able to recruit 22 households, 22 women and their spouses, but women were the ones who were trained to fish together in the farm and then connected to markets so that they could be able to improve their di dietary diversity. And not only that, but also earn their income. And uh, they, for this group, they only received agricultural training. And then we had a control group, which received nothing. So the lessons learned is uh, this tool, the ProWefi plus the HN uh, module, it's a very good diagnostic tool. Um, it's, it, we, we are able to decompose uh, the individual factors. Uh, the ability to decompose them allow us to, di to identify where the problem lies in terms of agency and empowerment of women, specifically in the agricultural sector. For our results show that for, for the, the women that we sample, the inability to move, to go to, to the market because of the puda and the social norm was one of the disempowering factor to the women. And uh, another factor was the lack of access uh, to credit and making decisions on financial services. 
which then tell us that in-depth assessment of the PROWEFI and its domain indicators can help project better design interventions to create targeted impact on critical domains, such as thinking of doing gender sensitization, gender transformative approaches, where should we focus on, and see how adequacy across different indicators change after an intervention. And using the qualitative tools, uh, the ladder of power and freedom from Genovate and the, the life history methodology from GAP, uh, from the GAP, GAP2, we were able to learn more about these landless women and how they differ from other women who come from um, stable uh, family with stable income, farming households who have the plot of land or who are educated. These landless women had higher um, in higher freedom of mobility compared to these other women. And this was attributed to their life circumstances. Being impoverished, the husband cannot restrict them from going to get work outside, such as making bricks, uh, you know, continue with the agricultural uh, farming that we introduced, do other things on the side in order to, to, to fend for their family. And in terms of the nutrition aspect, in terms of nutrition, we found that women had more um, had more power to make decisions in terms of their own health and diet, about 85% of them, child diet, weaning and breastfeeding, but um, less than 50% had adequacy in access to food and health products. And moreover, um, they did not have the, um, the nutrition-related education. They did not have access from nutrition-related education from NGO and health workers, except few of them you know, were able to get them when they were pregnant, where, when they were visiting clinics. And uh, they also noted that most women, they did not have um, the autonomy in terms of their reproductive health. You know, they are married, they are married at a younger age and they give birth at a very ad, a younger age, leading to trauma and birth related difficulties. So adding the HN module to this ProWefi tool, we were able to go beyond assessing the, repro the, repro the, the productive role of women and, and be able to look at the reproductive roles of women and how this impacts um, their lives. And for the Kenya, um, because of the meager resources, we did the abbreviated WEFI. So we scaled down the indicator from the 12 indicators of the pro WEFI to only six indicators. It takes shorter time to administer. It's, it's, it's very quick. And for that, we were able to learn that there aren't, there aren't many major differences of empowerment between men and women in terms of um, empowerment. But there are some areas that, you know, the data show that we could improve for women, such as um, the lack of uh, agency in the domains of production, resources, time, leadership, when, when observed. And in terms of nutrition, um, in most of the indicators, women reported achieving adequacy, with uh, exception of uh, one of the indicators where only 21% of them reported to have adequacy, which is input in decision to purchase food and health and health products. Again, this can ties up to um, the, 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 the you know the ability to have the purchasing power of the of the products. So all in all, we were able to learn a lot using this um, these tools, uh, which is a derivative of the ProWea and HN. And we are glad that we were able to partner with IFPRI um, and the funders to help us to, and, and the BMGF will help us to assess um, the impacts of the projects that we were carrying out. Thanks. Thanks, Rama, appreciate it. Our next panelist is Jeffrey Gantoli, Regional Coordinator for the Agricultural Technical Vocational Education and Training, or ATVET for Women Project for GIZ. Jeffrey, the pro way for market inclusion tools were tested and validated in Benin and Malawi as part of the AtVet for Women project. So what do you see as the added value of using these tools in the AtVet for Women portfolio? And can you share a specific example of how GIZ is using pro way for market inclusion tools and other programs? Over to you, thanks. So I'm uh, talking from Kenya, yeah. Um, I will uh, just uh, focus on two uh, information that are great information that I can uh, share from this uh, good and great uh, collaboration uh, between the project, the Advert for Women project and IFPRI. 
the background is that uh, uh, the 8Vet for Women project is the only one GG2 project uh, uh, in uh, GIZ uh, with a specific mandate uh, conceptualizing gender transformative change in uh, 8Vet. So this project was implemented in six countries, as you can see. And uh, the big challenge is to find a reliable and uh, very legitimate uh, tool and methodology to measure women empowerment since it's about gender transformative change. So uh, the time uh, was very uh, uh, lucky time that we met uh, IFPRI. Uh, IFPRI was able to, uh, to, offer, uh, to offer the PROWEA uh, tools with uh, 12 indicators uh, that can be used to do these measurements. And uh, that is uh, how through a high level uh, ADNEPAD, ADNEPAD is an African Union Development Agency of NEPAD. Uh, it was possible that uh, the uh, tools was piloted uh, at a project level in Benin and uh, in uh, uh, Malawi. So uh, from this experience, this nice experience, I think uh, the need was to go beyond uh, uh, focusing only on assessment, but also to think about how to run the project in the right direction to meet really these indicators. Next slide, please. And the second idea is uh, about yes the how we the project went beyond simple assessments and uh, that is through a kind of customizing the indicators from the proware and uh, generate uh, a very own uh, tools called gender puzzle. Gender puzzle is a kind of game, very easy to play, but showing uh, by, uh, by colors, uh, the three levels of power, showing the power di dynamic. And this was used by the target group. Target group are mostly uh, micro and uh, small enterprises in uh, agricultural sector, processing and uh, distributing the products mainly. And the, this tool, uh, gender puzzle with uh, 16 indicators is finally the core of one pro, uh, approach, training approach uh, called gender make business sense that uh, uh, contains six modules. And it's a kind of using gender lens uh, uh, to, to, to run business. As you can see, the gender transformative business vision as motivation and the starting point for change to our empowerment. And uh, this is uh, what was very appreciated by the target group because they were able to make a kind of diagnostic, diagnosis or appraisal to show where are the needs to do something for the empowerment. And this are, was applied to this uh, uh, business model canvas, as you can see, uh, which uh, is uh, really a uh, gender make businesses growth plan. Uh, that is a real social and economic balanced uh, business model. I think uh, this was used to train uh, more than 5,000 uh, uh, partners uh, in the six countries. And uh, already this gender make businesses uh, approach uh, was uh, uh, captured and uh, used, honor, owned, I can say, by some partner training institutions in Kenya uh, Kenya School uh, uh, of Agriculture, for example, in Ghana also. 
So um, that is uh, what could be mentioned. And uh, this approach was uh, awards in uh, uh, 2022 as uh, a, a, most, uh, uh, a, a most important things to promote in GIZ. Thank you very much and back to you. Great, thanks so much, Jeffrey, for those remarks. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll come back to you during the Q&A. So next, let me turn to David Spielman. David is Senior Research Fellow at IFPRI and Program Leader for the Rwanda Strategy Support Program. David, your program's working with the government of Rwanda on gender and gender inclusion issues in agriculture. We understand that you're working with the DFID-funded 2019 WEA baseline survey in Rwanda. So tell us more about what you learned there. And then looking into the future, what are your reflections on how using complementary indicators on health and nutrition and market inclusion can help inform policy? Sure, well, thanks very much, Dan. Rwanda is a really interesting case when it comes to the use and application of the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index. As, as you mentioned, Dan, uh, there was a baseline survey conducted by IMC Worldwide for the Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Resources, uh, Minagri, uh, uh, and funded by DFID, now FCDO. And the findings from that survey indicated that, you know, women and men in Rwanda are both, both had relatively high levels of empowerment across different agricultural domains. Most women were as empowered as men in their households. And compared to other countries in the region where similar measurements have been undertaken, women in Rwanda had, have relatively greater access to financial services and a relatively lower time burden in, uh, in agriculture. Um, the way of scores and the, and the gender parity index score was, were, were very high for Rwanda in, in relative terms. And maybe this doesn't surprise uh, anyone given all that we know about Rwanda's commitment to and action on improving gender equality since the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. Um, as you all know, you know, since 2018, Rwanda ranks in the, in the top five countries for gender equality, according to the Global Gender Gap Report. Um, Rwanda also has one of the highest proportions of, of members of parliament and chambers of deputies who are women. Um, uh, it sits at somewhere around 61, 62%, which is way above the global average of, of just 26%. But despite these, you know, these, these sort of accomplishments, both in, in the agriculture sector and the rural economy and in the, the country in general, you know, the findings from that, from that way of baseline showed that, you know, 28% of women still did not meet the threshold for empowerment. Um, 24% of women were not uh, as empowered as a primary adult male in their household. Um, and women were least empowered in terms of workload burden with 21% not reaching the empowerment threshold for this indicator. And of course, women were significantly less likely than men to access financial services, participate in the marketing of agricultural commodities, access have access to extension and advisory services. Um, and spend their time on productive uh, as well as reproductive work. So, you know, looking to the future, I think there, there are some important questions here. You know, how do we use the way of findings, the way of data and analysis to further advance women's empowerment and gender equality in Rwanda's agriculture sector and rural economy? And, and we've been thinking a lot about this. Um, let me quickly give you a couple of, of thoughts here. Uh, based on our experience and our work with the Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Resources. Um, first, there's a continuing need to mainstream gender into the formulation and implementation of policy in Rwanda, into the structure and the conduct of the state. And Rwanda has done a lot uh, on that on that front. There's a gender monitoring office housed in the prime minister's office, which is fairly high powered. Uh, uh, there are gender targets in many of the institutional and individual performance contracts uh, in civil service, uh, the imihigos as they're known. Um, and, and in Minagri with our partners in the past, though not at the moment, there was an advisor who actually vetted each and every policy and regulation for its relevance to gender, its sensitivity to gender. Um, so these and other organizational structures have gone a long way in ensuring accountability and action and really contextualizing uh, the, the, the way uh, scores that, that, that were uh, measured and, and, and collected. Um, 
But there's still probably scope for better understanding the effectiveness of these structures and and uh, incentives and and uh, and other sort of organizational arrangements um, in Rwanda and and their contribution to Rwanda's larger social and economic transformation process, which is why thinking about you know market inclusion and and nutrition and, and health indicators as as a complement to sort of you know the core way of product is really important. Second, in the agriculture sector in the rural economy of Rwanda, there's probably a big opportunity to better tackle the challenge of, of women's empowerment from a food systems perspective, where that nexus of agriculture, health, and nutrition is, is just you know, so core and so critical to the conversation. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's not sufficient for government to focus its agricultural spending on production and productivity uh, of food staples, right? The, the very choice of crops and livestock uh, uh, value chains to prioritize and which mechanisms to promote for their cultivation, management and consumption is a gendered question. Um, and having more data on issues related to that, that nutrition, health and market nexus with agriculture is, is incredibly critical from a gender perspective. Finally, on a more technical note, I think it's important from our experience in Rwanda to recognize that the WEA was never meant to be an end in itself, right? Um, that WEA baseline conducted in 2019 was collected in the absence of accompanying data on household expenditures, consumptions, production, migration, health, nutrition, and market activity. And those types of measures are, are essential to understanding the evidence pathways that were discussed earlier, or the, just the correlates and determinants of women's empowerment. We need, we want complementary data on health, nutrition, and market inclusion, and lots of other topics, which is precisely what allows us to fine tune policy design and implementation. So you can see exactly why this, this conversation we're having at this event is so important to us in the context of Rwanda. Uh, back to you. Sorry, unmuting now. David, thanks a lot. Um, thanks for your remarks and, and, and pressing for in, engaging the ProWay modules with other data for policy use. That's really helpful. We are going to transition now to uh, our Q&A portion of the event. And we have a number of questions already received and I encourage people to continue to submit questions as we go through the Q&A here. And I'll invite um, all of the panelists and speakers to please come back on video and we'll have a discussion. Um, so, and I'll, I'll go kind of around the table, if you will. So I'll start with Jeffrey for the first question. Uh, Jeffrey, were there ch any challenges that you encountered in applying the ProWay and market inclusion tools? You described them well and they're used, but if you could highlight some challenges, that would be help helpful. And then how did you overcome these challenges? Thanks. Uh, let me ask uh, my practitioner behind the curtain to come in immediately with these questions. Uh, this one, please. This one. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Jofra. Yeah, so a quick one. Uh, what we saw as a challenge was um, the adaptation of the indicators to suit our resources and also our timing. And so we found it wasn't uh, possible to implement the comprehensive uh, questionnaire of the ProWare, and we ended up adapting the response options and indeed uh, some questions just to make sure that the survey too, it's um, relatively short and that we could manage um, within a short period of time. And also, uh, we were not able to interview two individuals in a household. We interview, interviewed one person, uh, probably because we were targeting uh, a business person. And um, again, given the time limitation, we couldn't do that. So our results um, are not comparable within a household, meaning female and male counterparts, but rather giving uh, a picture on the empowerment and possibly uh, get some insights in terms of what actions we could do. Thank you so much. 
Yes, that's great, Dustin. Thank you. Thanks for coming in on that. Um, so my next question is for Hazel, and then I have one after that for Rama. So Hazel, um, from, this one's from Bill Kinsey. So why just a project focus? Why not scale it up and make it comparable, for example, to the DHS or the MICS? Yes, thanks. Thanks for the question, Dan. Um, so, I mean, we do already have metrics for population-based surveys. So that's the, the original WEA, a lot, as well as the abbreviated version of the WEA, which is a shorter version of that original WEA. So those tools were really intended to be measured at the population level. So those tools already exist. Um, the reason we developed the pro WEA was because there was a demand from the projects for indicators that reflected their needs. So areas that they wanted to affect in their projects that were relevant to their context. Um, and so we, you know, for the specific types of uh, projects we talked about today, health and nutrition projects and market inclusion projects, they also sort of had, you know, unique, you know, project goals. And that is why we had to, you know, we, we went in and developed those um, additional indicators for those types of projects. So um, really, uh, the, the reason why we're doing a project focus is because there was there was a gap there. there the projects needed a, a measure and those measures, the existing measures that were available at the population level were not really capturing the areas and, and domains that were more relevant for impact assessment at the project level. So thanks. Great, thanks, Hazel. Uh, next, I'm gonna to come to Rama and then David, I'll have a question for you after that. So Rama, what advice would you give to other research teams who would like to apply the ProWEA health and nutrition tools in a field based on your experience? Thank you, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, the first advice I would like to give them is, um, first of all, to make sure that they, they, they look closely on their budget and if and the timing, because pro fee or pro AI takes longer time than the a uh the abbreviated WEFI, because of the indicators. Again, I mean, here you have, a, for example, the abbreviated WEI or WEFI is shorter. And um, for ex if you have a meager resources, then it's better we go you go with the abbreviated version because you still look at those domains it's just you you just use you know smaller numbers of indicators and the thing is you can slot in with another big survey that you are working on like what we did in kenya we were looking at the gendered value chain for aquaculture in in, in kenya for six counties so we wanted to do that and we also wanted to to measure the women's empowerment in the aquaculture sector so the abbreviated wealthy was the, the best one to go because it's shorter to administer that means that that you spend less time in the field and then your, your respondent will not be tired to respond to your question. And also the other thing is you need to make sure that the enumerators you, 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 you want to collect data with are well trained. Um, I mean, this tool is different from the household survey tool. They really need to understand, for example, how to, to record the time activity uh, the activity that are being carried out in the household and the time it takes for, for, for the women to do the chores and how many activities there are in the household. There are so many activities. For example, in the abbreviated WEFI, we had 27 activities. And for some of our enumerators, even though we went through the training several times, they still made errors. They did not actually, you know, we collect the data according to time interval, but they focus on activity. So at the end of the day, for these for these few enumerators, what we found is for the for the one day of, of measuring the activity of the household, we had more than 24 hours uh, recorded. So what, what are you going to do with that data? You either have to decide to drop it or find a way to justify how you want to use it or drop that domain completely and say you're going to you, you're just going to measure according to those, you know, five indicators and this the, 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 the work life balance indicator, you don't look at it. So make sure your, your, the, the data collectors that you're using are well-trained, they understand each indicator and the intricacies of why they're doing what they're doing properly. And if you have to do you know, several versions of trials in the field, go and do it. So then you have good quality data that you can use and analyze and it's sound and you can present it with confidence rather than having to drop some of the indicators, which are very important, especially if you're trying to assess women's empowerment. 
So, I mean, there are several other um, advice that I would give, but I think look at your budget so that you know which tool is, 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 is good for you to use and you'll be able to get the same um, type of measurement that you want to use and then make sure the people you are using to collect the data are well trained in the data collection and they know why they are collecting that indicator and how important that indicator is before you go to them with the, in the field. So that's it. Rama, thanks a lot. Yeah, that's really helpful and uh, really agree on, on the issue about, about careful training on these modules and the, the return you get to that in terms of less measurement error and, and better data. Um, David, I'm coming to you. So you've been on the ground, so to speak, uh, working with policymakers in Rwanda. How have they responded to having data from Leia in their toolkit? And how do you think uh, they would respond to having additional information such as those from the pro Wea complementary indicators? So is this a case of TMI? Is this too much information or is this information actually going to be used? I think it's a really, a really good question. It's a tough one too. I, I think, you know, the, Obviously, the spirit and the interest in in uh, women's empowerment and gender equality uh, underpins a lot of work that, that our partners in government do or think about. But I think I think it has been a challenge moving from from you know from intentions to to action within government. As I said earlier, there are a lot of good uh you know structures in place to think about these issues and sort of prioritize these issues even in in administrative implementation and things like that but but using metrics uh like this or using the the the, the concepts and relationships that drive these you know the, the formulation of these metrics um is still is still sort of a work in progress and i think that's going to be you know sort of socializing way uh into into policy decision making processes in the future is going to be uh, uh, really important, uh, and and that's what we're working to. I mean, I think the concern was that the 2019 baseline that was done just sort of uh, it was done, it was presented, it was validated, it stood there, and no one's worked with it since. And that's what we're trying to do, and to crowd people in to socialize it a lot more and think more about, okay, well, where do we go from here? How do we use these metrics to, to really, really um, understand, you know, the drivers of women empowerment and gender equality? That's great. Yeah, thanks, David. I uh, appreciate that perspective. I'll, I'll come to Hazel next, actually. This question is from uh, Ricardo Vargas. So is there any publication with more details about pro way of market inclusion indicators? Yes, thank you. Um, this is a great chance. I, I meant to mention it in my presentation. Um, we do have a discussion paper coming up next week. So we uh, have a paper that will uh, talk about how the tools evolved over the course of these four studies. And so please watch out for that publication coming out around International Women's Day. Um, we also have all the other um, papers that our research has been based on. So as Jessica mentioned, the health and nutrition paper is available and that's out uh, op as an open access paper. I think all of our GAP2 papers are out as open access. So um, we have uh, all of that information should be in our in our resource center. And then I did want to take a chance, take a moment to acknowledge the, the funding support because um, this entire research project um, was really a, a combination of support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USAID, GIZ, the Millennium Challenge Corporation. So all of those, all of that support may, uh, helped us put all these papers out um, for you to refer to. So thank you so much. Yes, thanks, Hazel. I appreciate that. So uh, I will come next to Inga. Um, Inga, this question is about shift. So shift is hoping to change or shift the diets of populations towards healthier and more nutritious sources. We know that many people will meet their diet needs through markets. So how will indicators like ProWaya, Health and Nutrition, and the ProWaya for Market Inclusion be useful to the shift initiative? And what is their practical support? You're on mute, sorry, Inga. Sorry, after this year, she would expect that uh, you're used to unmute. So okay. this is really a great question then. So as I indicated already, um, we do not understand yet fully uh, the role of women in the micro, small and medium enterprises. And I think the ProVaya 
um, and especially the market inclusive pro area will help us to understand this role and help us also to better um, guide um, our selection of innovations that we would like to test out. And in addition to that, um, also the pro area will help us um, to evaluate the interventions that we are implementing to see what that would mean for the role of women or for the women agency um, when we focus on uh, more involvement of women in the in the markets, in the informal markets. Um, I have to admit that we did not do yet or did not implement yet um, any pro -vaya, um indicators in our questionnaires that, that we are using, but we are definitely planning to do so to make it more gender um, um, inclusive um, and the research more focused on the role um, of our interventions to uh, uh, gender or to women's um, agency in, in the future. Um, the VAIA itself uh, was a bit too complicated for our partners uh, to implement, I have to admit. Um, uh, but the pro -vaya is a bit simpler also to understand for our partners in the countries um, uh, we work. So it's uh, Ethiopia, Bangladesh and uh, Vietnam. And I do see really very practical um, impl uh, implementation of the pro -vaya. And also uh, we can um, have uh, opportunities to test out some of the assumptions um, and um, uh, challenges that are actually going along uh, with implementing this Provea. So I'm, I'm really very enthusiastic um, that you can use it in our project and that we can use it with our strategic partners in the country. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Inga. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to come to Jessica next. Um, this is a question from Lan Nguyen. So does the health and nutrition module measure perceived or actual access to food, Jessica? And then a follow up to that is, uh, to what extent are the health and nutrition and market inclusion modules essentially associated with the ProWaya module? Uh, to what extent do they overlap and or differentiate? Thank you. Thanks for the question, Lan, and for and, and to Dan as well. So uh, the the health and nutrition module indicator on um, access to food measures perceived access to food. Um, we recommend general if, gen generally, if you uh, want to better understand what individuals' actual diets are, that you include additional indicators related to to to, to diets um, in your in your overall in your overall study. Additionally, there are indicators um, on on decides about um, diets, on deciding about diets, and those are related to like if the food is in the home whether or not the women can, woman can decide to consume it or offer it to her child. Um, so again, that's really um, diving into the focus on agency specifically. Um, and so, um, and the next question related to um, the extent to which these indicators are associated with core ProWea, um, we do a number of statistical tests in the development of, of these of these indicators to look at um, both the associations with the core ProWea indicators and redundancy with them, and and those are um, provided in in much more detail in in the publicly available paper um, that you can look at. But in general, we find that um, that the health and nutrition indicators are are measuring domains that are distinct from those that are being measured in core ProWea. So they are unique um, and they're a valuable additional content to, to measure. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. I'm gonna stay with you actually for the next question. Uh, this one from Lad at USAID. So the question is, who did you consult with in terms of gender experts, market, market systems developers, or food systems experts? Um, in the development of these modules? And then is there any extensive investigation into implementation around these topics? And how will this fit into ag programs that don't have any nutrition targets? Sure. So um, throughout the development of both the health and nutrition add-on, as well as the market inclusion add-on, we had um, extensive consultations with a wide number of people for the health and nutrition um, 
add-ons in particular, that process started um, about seven and a half years ago. Um, and we, we consulted with a number of, of, of major NGOs who implement this type of work, as well as those who um, do impact evaluations of, of this type of work. Um, and so um, in addition to that, all of the projects that that were involved in the development of these modules had um, had a comp complementary qualitative work that was undertaken that um, helped us understand the implementation of those of those different programs. And and we don't go into we didn't go into those in detail in uh, today in this in these presentations, um, but um, there's definitely a lot a lot of work that was put into those. Um, and then to answer the last question related to, well, what do we do if our project doesn't focus on health and nutrition? I mean, it, that's you know, a pretty straightforward answer in that you don't have to include these modules. They're all optional. Um, there's the core ProWEA that can be used with a wide variety of agricultural development projects that, that have a focus on women's empowerment. Um, and then you can add on and select the market inclusion module or the health and nutrition module and or particular indicators from within those modules um, in order to um, do what makes most sense for your project. Um, thank you. Great, thanks, Jessica, I appreciate that. Um, Hazel, I'm gonna come to you. So this question is from uh, Webjo Emil Pongbun. And the question is, can we have the data collection tools for the ProWay uh, and MI and the ProWaya and HN on the History ProWaya page. So when will those be up and available? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, in general, um, we do include the data collection tools as annexes to the respective publications. And then many of those are also posted on the Resource Center. So some of the newer work like around market inclusion, we're still working towards um, populating all of that, but eventually all of those will be up in our Resource Center. So do sign up for updates on that. And you can always reach out to our Resource Center um, email address um, for any additional questions. Yeah. Great, I'm gonna stay with you, Hazel. Um, so another one is from, this one's from uh, Janeth Toronto, uh, MSC in Agricultural Extension in Kenya. So can we use WEA and MI for women inclusion and climate smart agricultural practices as agribusiness? And is it like any other data collection tool like, uh, like Kobo Collect? Right. Okay. So this is a great question. I think um, I would encourage the user, I mean, potentially, yes, if it's about agribusiness, I think, um, you know, a number of the market inclusion indicators could potentially be useful. I would encourage you, uh, Janet, to kind of think through um, your theory of change and just really kind of understand like where are sort of the pathways that you're expecting change to unfold and what kind of interventions are are happening. Um, we do not yet have, you know, um, specific uh, indicators around agency on climate specifically, but we do have these other, uh, you know, we have the core pro way indicators as we talked about and then the market inclusion indicators, and some of those could could be relevant. So I think it's more about sort of really understanding what kind of interventions you're trying to do and sort of selecting um, which ones of those would seem, you know, would, would you would be expecting to change or would like to monitor for unintended consequences. So yes, um, that's certainly possible. Great, Hazel. Uh, Jessica, this one is from uh, Obi Akunwa at Kansas State University. So are resources available to construct the HN indicator that can be shared? Yeah, um, all of that, first of all, is um, available in some um, online and some um, appendices for, for the paper. Um, additionally, they are, we are in the process of posting them on the WEA Resource Center. So two potential locations where you can hunt down that information and make use of it. Great, and you get the next question too, and this might be our last, because we just have about a minute left. Um, this one's coming from Lan Nguyen at, at uh, Wageningen University in Research. So does the food access component of the HN module distinguish between agency barriers and financial barriers and or availability of food? Um, 
No, we primarily focus on agency in in um, in these in these indicators. Okay, great. Um, let's see. So I, I will bring one last question. So Jessica, I'm going to stay with you. So this is uh, <laughs> it's from Veronica Corti, uh, Gender and Socioeconomic Developments. Um, so what is preventing sanitation from being given more weight since it is um, high in MPI and reflects uh, local governance on women's empowerment and the big picture on public health? Great, yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question. So when we initially did the consultations with the nutrition sensitive agricultural projects that were interested in in piloting this module, um, none of them had a big none of them had a big focus on on wash. Um, it um, since then wash has um, become a much bigger priority and has sort of hit the hit the mainstream in toward in terms of nutrition sensitive. Um, agriculture. Um, and as a result of that, we are currently working on developing additional um, indicators. We have, um, at, for the moment, named this tool We Wash Women's Empowerment in, in Wash. Um, and we're currently piloting um, this, this, new, this new work in both Malawi and in Nepal. When I say currently, I mean like in the field right now. So hopefully we will um, be able to have some um, results from that to share with you um, later this year. Thank you. Great, thanks everyone. I wanna thank um, all the panelists and all of our speakers uh, for that great discussion. Um, really appreciate it. It's great to get these perspectives. Uh, we're, I'm gonna close the Q&A now and I, I want to go now to uh, Farzana Ramzan uh, for some closing remarks. Farzana is Senior Gender Advisor at the United States Agency for International Development. So Farzana, over to you, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, first, I wanted to congratulate IFPRI on their work leading uh, on the development of complementary PROWIA indicators on market inclusion and on women's health and nutrition agency. Equally, a big thank you to the panelists and to all the partners involved in this work uh, for your contributions in advancing the development of these indicators. Earlier this year, the US government launched the first ever interagency strategy on global women's economic security, which envisions a world in which women and girls are able to fully, meaningfully, and equally contribute to and benefit from economic growth and global prosperity. In USAID's agriculture, food, and water systems work, we recognize that our activities engage women and men beyond production. And for rural women as entrepreneurs, as workers in food processing, retail, trade, across the value chain, we know that we must invest in women's economic security through opportunities across the food and water system, both in production and in value chain segments beyond production. At the same time, for USAID and our partners, there was a clear gap in our ability to really identify and measure the barriers to women's and men's market access and inclusion and to track progress in reducing these barriers. It's really important that contextual factors such as access to reliable sanitation and feeling safe from sexual harassment are also included in the complementary market inclusion indicators. Similarly, capturing decision making related to women's health and nutrition in nutrition sensitive agriculture projects is important to use alongside other nutrition and diet related outcomes, as we heard from the presenters earlier on. All the presentations were super interesting, uh, and in particular, it was great to hear about how the health and nutrition indicators were used alongside the PROWIA and the WEFI in Bangladesh to understand women's empowerment and adequacy in empowerment domains in aquaculture, nutrition, and cash transfer programs. It was also really nice to hear about how the PROWIA for market inclusion was adapted and used in Malawi, Benin, and Rwanda. Overall, uh, it's really nice that these indicators are ready for use in monitoring and evaluation. And most importantly, for the evidence the data can generate in guiding policies and programs in agri-food and water systems, as we also heard today. For USAID, following the 2021 launch of the updated US government's global food security strategy, 
Feed the Future is also working on integrating project level WIA indicators into our monitoring framework. And these new indicators and applications will also provide more opportunities for our partners to strengthen reporting on and learning about gender equality and women's empowerment in market inclusion, health, and nutrition sensitive agriculture activities. Finally, as many of you are aware, last year was the 10th anniversary of the launch of the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index. And last year, USAID Administrator Samantha Power spoke at the UN Commission on the status of women on the importance of the WIA in closing the gender data gap in agriculture and for advancing women's empowerment and gender equity in policies and programs. So once again, a big thank you to IFPRI and all the partners who contributed to the development of these complementary indicators and for improving our ability to understand and reduce the barriers to market inclusion for women and men and to work towards increasing women's decision making power in the areas of nutrition and health in all of our agriculture, food and water systems projects. So thank you all and uh, back to you, Dan. Okay, and thank you very much, and, and thanks very much for your support, uh, Farzana. And with that, we'll close our, our policy seminar. Uh, thanks to all of our partners, donors, and users for the, their support and the feedback on the way of tools. And thank you all for participating today. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you.